I'm Leslie Allman. I am very proud to be in this most recent issue of Nine Mile Magazine. And I, I'm delighted to read some of the poems from it. Um, the poems, the, well, all three of them, I'm going to read one now. All the titles come from Brian Eno's Oblique Strategies. Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt wrote 110 wacky little prompts um, way back in the 70s to try to jar, uh, help, help artists break out of lateral thinking when they were stuck and just bounce them into another part of their brain where they might get unstuck and do something unexpected. So I took all of them as titles for 110 poems. I didn't keep them all, of course. Um, but I, I wanted to let those titles catapult me somewhere, just as they were meant to do for artists and composers. And I had a wonderful time doing them. And so um, this first poem comes from one of the strategies. And so all the titles are theirs. Honor thy error as hidden intention. Robert Motherwell raised his brush, muttering, his whole body stretching into his mistakes. I have uttered wrong words, cliches that fell flat, but sometimes, sometimes led away from themselves to unexpected freedoms and misspellings turned visitations. Once I wrote slightful and felt a little ghost tickling my shoulder. See how spilled toothpicks make a lattice Mondrian lost and found himself in? Water everywhere finds its way down, creating fissures, havoc, mud, trembling and tumbling and buffing river stones to a smoothness Henry Moore loved as silhouette and skin, woman, repose. Gravity never apologizes for a mess though I have made errors from which the court inside me will never let me off. Fault line, plucked nerve of shame. Jackson Pollock just poured more paint on the canvas every time a can, oops, tipped over. Another title from Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt. This is Faced with a Choice, Do Both. I wish I was dead, a friend mumbled on the chairlift a month after his wife died. Mumbled so low, I wasn't sure I heard. After I asked how he planned to spend his winter. Dead, his voice, the sear cauterized small talk, his abyss now mine. I had never heard this in a voice before, utterance from the realm of endings. I touched his arm, feeling the chill slice me, bind me, and then we skied down that sparkling mountain, dead, dead, as we carved our turns from the habit of living, dead, a curtain I suddenly could not part, vacuum I could never again dismiss, dead, the two of us, savoring our skills even then, because what else could we do as our skis caressed from memory, the loved terrain and bright snow, sunlight touching us, dying all over. This one is Think of the Radio. And I have three radios in this poem, so each section is separated by an asterisk and then a new radio comes in. Think of the radio. For example, the blonde wood console where your, par your grandparents gathered, a map of Europe spread before them as they traced Hitler's shadow spreading through France. And Roosevelt from his fireside <clears throat> sought to calm them. And in London, night after night, deep underground through blackouts and strafings, the BBC kept lit the candle of the King's English. And the hive on your first nightstand, built of something like Bakelite, frame and cross pieces trussing its speakers like chrome on a mid-century Chevy, 
It eased you away from the void. Dragnet breathing beside your pillow. It's music scarier than its plots, but less scary than your solitude. Later, Wolfman's nicotine rasp, the voice of night itself, introduced you to rock and roll that would follow you through your teens on a pink transistor to the beach and panel dens, its single antenna funneling the swoon of cheek to cheek, trippy lights and revved engines, your future hovering. And today's evangelical stations, all you can pick up while driving late through lunar stretches of this country if you don't have satellite. By reflex, you reach to turn them off. But sometimes a familiar child peering into the bottomless hour reappears inside you, hungry for any voice that might talk her down from the dark. 